You know a good storyteller? You know a good storyteller? Maybe some of you are good storytellers, you know, especially when you're out in the fishing boat and, uh, and that big one gets away, you know? Or uh, you're out hunting. Yeah, and there's that, there's that, the biggest buck that you've ever seen, and it just, something gets in the way, spooks it, it sneaks away. You know, you know sometimes um, our stories might get just a little bit embellished, huh? And, uh, well, good storytellers are able to embellish a story, and you don't even know whether it's, I, I once had a, had a friend who said, now let me tell you a real story. And I thought, a real story, okay. And he started telling me this very tall tale. So it was a real story. Uh, there, there wasn't a whole lot of truth to it. But uh, you know, he had this ability to communicate so well that it just captivates the attention, captivates the imagination. And um, it, it was a real story. Um, some of us enjoy stories. We enjoy getting uh, underneath the surface of a, of a plot and unpacking that plot. Maybe it's a, a mystery, a, who, a whodunit. Maybe it's something about relationships. Uh, maybe, it's, maybe we get into stories uh, that are based in history. You know, we, we, we love to, um, to read up on uh, wartime history, you know, whether it's the Revolutionary War, all the way through uh, the most recent conflicts that we've had in the world around us. We are captivated often by stories, and the better the communicator, the, the more often we get engaged with the story. Well, I once heard it uh, said that the, the Bible is God's story of his love for us. And so it, it is a true story. It's, a, it's not just a real story, it's a true story. Um, we, might, uh, we might run across some folks who think it's a, it's a real story. You know, it's, it's, no, this is a true story. This is a true story of, of Jesus and his love for us. God's activity throughout all of history. And um, in it, of course, we have the gospel. We have the good news. The good news of new life in Jesus Christ for everyone who believes. Do you remember the first time you heard the gospel? Do you remember the circumstances in which uh, you heard the story of Jesus and his love the first time? Do you remember who was telling it? Do you remember how it was told? Do you remember what your response was to it? Do you remember the time that you heard the story of the gospel? It was communicated to you in such a way where you knew that you had to respond. You had to respond in, in an affirmative manner and, and say, yes, I believe that Jesus did that for me. Now, there are all ways, all kinds of ways to communicate the gospel. There is the, the public preaching of God's word like, like we do every Sunday. Uh, there are those who uh, have the skill of doing chalk talks. Uh, you know what a chalk talk is. Uh, in fact, I'm sure there have been chalk talks done here in this very place. Uh, I know not in the last 26 and a half years. Uh, I don't remember a chalk talk being done here. But, you know, someone who will begin to illustrate uh, a Bible passage or illustrate what he or she is saying by putting together a chalk drawing. And then um, there are some things that you can see and then some things that you can't see. And then they turn on the ultraviolet light. And all, so all of a sudden something comes popping off of the, off of the, the canvas, so to speak. Now, there are all kinds of ways to communicate uh, the gospel. What can we learn from the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Thessalonians about how we communicate the gospel? Well, uh, let's catch up just a little bit. Why are we studying 1 Thessalonians? We're studying 1 Thessalonians because there are people like them all around us, people who are for Jesus, people who are against Jesus, and people who need to open their hearts to Jesus. We need, like the Thessalonians, to live in the light of Jesus' imminent return. That's a huge theme, especially as we get to the end of the book. Um, we need to do it with noble character, encouraging one another to live out the love and extend the grace of Jesus so that others might believe. Last Sunday, we talked about the conviction of the gospel. We talked about our convictions, what what stands out in importance to us. 
Um, the bottom line is our convictions need to communicate the preeminence of Jesus Christ and the truth of his word because the gospel has transformed us. So how are we being transformed? How are we being made less like our earthly, human, fleshly selves and more like the Lord Jesus Christ? Who is watching us as we emulate, as we imitate the Lord in our lives? And making the transition now into chapter 2, we ask ourselves the question, how do our convictions need to grow as we extend our living testimony of the gospel? We can speak the gospel even by our lives, and sometimes we can use words. Now we're talking about uh, how we do that. The Apostle Paul moves from this greeting to the Thessalonian people, uh, establishing, reestablishing his relationship with them, and then um, we see that in chapter 2, there are two ways that we can communicate. The gospel is presented in words. Well, well, yes, the gospel is words that put together, they make sense, and they tell us about who God is and what he's done for us. And that's exactly where Paul started in every place that he went. He started with the gospel. You know, when we speak with people about who Jesus is, we start with the gospel. We have to start with the gospel. Because in the gospel, that, that's the power of God for salvation for all who believe. And that's what Paul did. Look at the first two verses in 1 Thessalonians 2. You know, brothers, that our visit to you was not a failure. Well, why would you say it was a failure? Well, they started to uh, raise some opposition. There were people who were very vocal about their opposition to the gospel, especially as Paul presented it and preached it in the temple, in the synagogue, rather. Uh, the, the crowds did not like that. Well, the crowds did. It was the teachers of the law that did not like it. Um, and they started making these accusations. And um, when it was all said and done, we know from Acts chapter 17, the first part of Acts 17, that um, a riot pretty much broke out. And they had to take Paul, the believers in Thessalonica, had to take Paul, put him in protective custody, and then sneak him out at night so he could go on down the road to Berea. Uh, some of them were thinking, oh, yeah, what a failure. We didn't get to have Paul with us very long. We didn't get to sit under his teaching for you know, as long as we wanted to. And things got so out of hand here that we, we had to sneak him out of town before they, before they hung him or, or executed him. No, it was not a failure. It was not a failure. Paul is familiar with suffering for the gospel. We had previously, verse 2, suffered and been insulted in Philippi, as you know. And the same thing happened in Philippi. They were just in Philippi before coming to Thessalonica, and then they went on to Berea, and then they went on to Athens after that. So everywhere Paul went, he started with the gospel. Why? Sometimes we think the gospel is limited to the New Testament. No, oh, the gospel is, is sprinkled throughout the Old Testament. The story of God and his love for mankind, shown to us in the Lord Jesus Christ, his anointed one, the Messiah, Messiah Jesus, was coming. That was his plan all along. And Paul, when he was given his ministry, his ministry was what? To the Jews first and then to the Gentiles. Much like Jesus, the Jews did not receive his message, so he went on and he preached to the Gentiles. Isn't it interesting that here in Thessalonica, there were both Jews and Gentiles mixed together, hearing him teaching, where? In the synagogue. And we know that many Jews believed as well as many, uh, many of the, the Gentiles. But he started with the gospel, and the ministry of the gospel was not a failure. As we see, um, with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in spite of strong opposition. Oh, now there's, there's a stopper. There's a stopper for a lot of us. Whenever someone says something like, well, you don't have any right to jam down your religion down my throat, stop doing that. 
what happens most of the time? We stop. Hmm. Paul stood up for the gospel. In spite of strong opposition, he continued. He continued to speak the gospel. And that's something we might need to take to heart just a little more as we live in this day and age. We need to remember to start with the gospel with people. We need to start with the gospel. Hmm. How do we do that? How do we do that? Well, let's move on. What was Paul's motivation? Look at verses 3 and 4 with me. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as men approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please men, but God who tests our hearts. Now let's, let's unpack uh, the principles in verses 3 and 4. What was Paul's motivation to preach the gospel? I think we can put it down into four words. Truth with a capital T, which is significant. Purity, integrity, and accountability. Truth, purity, integrity, and accountability. Now, uh, how does that play out? How does that play out? Well, um, you can see the motivation sometimes of public speakers. What are they trying to do? They're trying to win you over to uh, something that they want you to, to take to heart or maybe something they want you to take home. You ever been to one of the big box stores where they're, you know, you know if you're hungry when you go to shop at one of these big box stores, if you, if you time it right, you won't go out of there hungry because there are people who are giving samples. Oh, those samples, sometimes they're, they're hard to walk past. Sometimes it doesn't sound any good at all to me. And it, it's easy to walk past, but sometimes, oh, yeah, my, my mouth's starting to water already. Uh, their motive is to get you to take what they have for you. Now, how do they communicate it? Well, uh, it, it's been interesting. I'll follow along on, on the sample provider. You know, you get within three feet of their cart, and they start talking in a monotone like this. And, you know, I stop three feet past their cart, and someone else is walking along, and it's the same, it's the same speech in a monotone over and over and over again. But then there's someone who's really excited about the sample. Maybe people are really taking um, their, their fried kumquats and chocolate sauce or whatever it is. And, oh, come and you've got to try this. And, and they're very vocally enthusiastic about it. Yeah. Uh, there are all kinds of ways that people communicate. And whether it's a monotone or whether it's very uh, verbose and very encouraging and enthusiastic, they're all motivated by the same thing. They want you to take what you got. We need to be motivated to have people take what we have to give them, the love, and <coughs> the love of, the Lord, of the Lord and the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to do it with the right motivation, truth, purity, integrity, and accountability. Now, how does that play out? Paul puts it this way. He says that they are approved by God. So he talks about his motivation. It's not error in pure motives. And we're not trying to trick you. It's not bait and switch. It's not that kind of operation. But he does it as a men approved by God. Approved by God. Yeah. How, how do you get approved by God? You get approved by God by giving your life to him, by accepting the gift of salvation that you have in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how you get approved by God. So we're all, if you know Jesus this morning, you're approved by God to share the gospel. He says, you know what? He's my friend. He's on my side. He's got what it takes. He knows my son. He has accepted the gift of new life that I have for him. Now, Paul and those who were traveling with him were approved by God, not just approved by God, but entrusted with the gospel. Entrusted with the gospel. On my desk in my office, I have, I have a, a little... Uh, rack, and in that little rack are five Bibles. 
and the one all the way on the end is my second Bible. I have my first Bible at home, my second Bible that my grandmother gave me at Christmas time in 1973. It's, it's right there. And that was the Bible I used all pretty much until I went up, went, went into college. And I had all kinds of notes in there. I have all kinds of, all kinds of stuff in there. You know, the Bible filing system started there. You know the Bible filing system, right? Where you take notes that you take during sermons and bulletins and all that stuff, and you put it in your Bible so it's always there, right? Uh, or articles that you read, that kind of thing. Uh, your Bible filing system, yeah. Well, um, in God's Word, we have the Gospel. God's Word is entrusted to us. We are called as His children to hold on to it and he gives it to us that we might share it with others. The next thing we see here is that um, approved by God, entrusted with the gospel, we're not trying to please men, but God, who tests the heart. Hmm. God's pleasure is found when people that he approves and trust with the gospel, actually go and share it. That's pleasing to God. He tests the heart. We're not doing it to please men. We're not doing it to be able to come back and, and say to uh, the pastor or whoever, that, oh, I saved 25 people this afternoon. I said, no, you didn't save anybody. God's the one that does the saving. You know, uh, It's pleasing to God when we communicate the story of Jesus and his love. God tests our heart. He tests our motivation. Uh, if we have enough love for him and enough love for others, it, we will go and we will share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's pleasing to him. When we present the gospel, we have to do it uh, with great care, though. Yeah, we need to start with the gospel. We need to be motivated by truth, purity, integrity, accountability. We don't want to trick anybody. And Paul gets into that idea a little more in verses 5 and 6 in the first part of verse 7. When we communicate the gospel with words, we must do it honestly and simply. Honestly, we'll start there. Uh, look what it says in, in verse 5. You know we never used flattery. We never used flattery. Well, you know, sometimes we feel very flattered when people make mention of something we're wearing or something we say or something we've done, and they, they want to butter us up. They, wanna, they want us to uh, have a good impression of, of them, uh, so they, they flatter us by making us feel better about ourselves. Yeah, uh, Paul speaks honestly. He doesn't flatter people doesn't do that and we shouldn't flatter people with the gospel we shouldn't appeal to anything about them we should be appealing to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God uh, Paul goes on and he says not with flattery nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed God is our witness let me uh, get into the root of this word um, that has to do with pretense. You know, someone who is pretentious. Uh, they're always trying to, to wheel and deal. They, they have a, a, maybe a hidden motivation, a hidden, a hidden uh, goal. And they want to get something from you, and they do it from greed, from the standpoint of greed. You see, this idea of tricking someone, uh, we all probably have heard about uh, some who have stood in, in in the pulpit or behind a sacred desk, much like this, and it's been all about money. Give me your money, and God will take care of you, is basically the message. Oh, no, that, that's not it. Um, the name it and claim it thing doesn't work the way they say it does. See, if we speak honestly... The, the words of the truth of the gospel, we, we do it not with pretense from greed. We do it honestly instead. And we also do it not to please people, but God. Look at verse 6. We were not looking for praise from men, not for you, 
or anyone else. As apostles of Christ, we could have been a burden to you, but we were gentle among you. We were gentle among you, uh, like little children. So the whole idea, when we open our mouths to speak the gospel, we need to do so honestly. We need to do so simply. We need to do uh, so that we please God. Because you know what? It, it's a story of his love. It's a story of his communication with man in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes we have to put aside some of the negative examples that we have encountered that have really turned us off. And if it's turned us off, guess how much more it's turned off those who don't know the Lord Jesus. Yeah, we can't communicate in that way. We have to start with the gospel. We have to, uh, we have to please God. And isn't it interesting that that comes through twice in how we present the gospel with our words? Well, that's words. It's a lot of words about words. Sometimes uh, I, I hear the teachers uh, in my family saying, you can't use too much words. Not, not to me, but they're, they're talking with one another. Sometimes when, when you're, you're trying to correct a child or correct a student, when you're trying to encourage a child, encourage a, a student, sometimes the multiplicity of words does not get across the point any better. So then what do we do? We need to present the gospel by works by words and works. How does this work? Well, Paul gives us three examples of people who, by their works, demonstrate their love for others. The first one we have is as a mother. Continuing on in verse 7, we were gentle among you like a mother caring for her little children. Okay, as a mother, well, moms, you know how you care and love your children. You know how you would do anything for them. Even from the very beginning, what do we see here? What did, uh, what did mothers do? Um, we loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of, of God, but our lives as well. Um, some of the translations you might have uh, speaks of a, of a mother gently nursing her children. Some of you may have had the opportunity to, to nurse your children, to provide for them the sustenance and the, and the life-giving fluids that they needed at the very beginning of their lives and maybe on uh, for, for a time. What, a, what an intimate, gentle setting where a child is able to get everything that they need for life and health and strength from you. What, what an example. What an example of showing the, our works in such a way that people would understand the love of God. We have to do it like a mother, like a mother gently nursing her children with care, with care. I know, Mom, sometimes there's, there's frustrations. You'd like to take that child and set them down and give them a stern talking to But sometimes you need to do that still with care and you need to do it lovingly. When we think of the mother that um, is probably put forward as a stereotypical successful mother, these are three things that, that come up. The bottom line, these three illustrations that, that Paul uses points to this idea of, of sharing life, sharing life. We, were, we loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well, because you had come so dear to us. Isn't that what we as parents want with our children more than anything else? We want that shared life with them. You see, that's what moved Paul to demonstrate the work of the gospel as he demonstrated the love of God shown to us in the gospel by sharing life. And he, he was delighted 
not only to share the gospel, but to share their lives. Share their lives. Not just handing out what they think was needed at the time, but to take that next level relationship. A child that can come to mom with anything that they need. And a mom that can come to a child with anything that they need. With that relationship so close that there's trust and there's, um, there's a, a bonding there that is so, so hard to break. As a mother, sharing life. That's one model of how Paul communicated the gospel by works. Additionally, if we look at verses 9 and 10, he did so as a sibling. Look what he says in the, uh, the first phrase in verse 9. Surely you remember, brothers, our toil and hardship. As a sibling, with our brothers and sisters in Christ, yes, we can share the gospel. We can present the gospel by our works as a sibling, as a sibling. And he talks about this example of toil and, and hardship. You remember our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order to not be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel to you. So uh, look at this, this example of toil and hardship. Okay, so um, when you've moved, especially maybe when you were younger, who was your moving crew? You called your family, right? You called your brothers and sisters. And I remember earlier, early in our marriage, we moved one, two, in five years, we moved one, two, three times. And uh, my brother-in-law said, you're moving again? He had the trailer, and that helped a lot, you know? Uh, but yeah, yeah, we, we, we moved three times in five years. Um, now we haven't moved once in 20, eight years, so... Uh, we've been in, we've been in the same spot, yeah. Who do you call? You, you call your brothers and your sisters right away. The example of giving toil and hardship, going the extra mile, taking care of their needs. But he also talks about an example in verse ten. Your witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believe. So as a sibling we have the responsibility uh, as brothers and sisters in Christ, as we're communicating the gospel with our works, we have the responsibility to be an example of these three things, holiness, righteousness, blamelessness. We need to conduct ourselves in a way that pleases God with one another. And so that's important. Why? Because people are watching us, people in the family and people outside the family. They're watching us. As we present the gospel of our works, we have to do it as a mother, we have to do it as a, as a sibling, but also as a father. As a father, how? Look at verses 11 and 12. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children. Now we could just end it right there, right? Dealing with your own children. How do you deal with your own children? Oh, wait until your father gets home, right? <laughs> and... Here, here comes the year old dad home from work, and everything's, everything's so, so tense. Maybe even if it was the worst day at work, you want to go back. No. Uh, as a father deals with your own children, sometimes we get the idea of the disciplinarian. You know? But how do we see a father dealing with his own children? We have to read the rest of verse 12. <coughs> Encouraging. Encouraging. Okay, encouraging. Grab on to that thing that the child does well and encourage them to excel still more. Now, you can also encourage a child to do what? To change the behavior that's negative and do the right thing the first time, right? Yeah. We need to encourage them. We need to not drag them down and beat them up. We need to encourage them, encourage them, even though... When we act out of frustration, it, it, uh, it maybe not turn out as encouraging as it needs to be. Comforting. 
comforting. Well, you know, when your child comes running to you crying, no matter what age they are, what do you do? What do you do? You need to embrace them, comfort them, come alongside them, build them up. Listen. Encourage them to walk with God and yet comfort them in knowing that uh, his love for them never changes. And really, your love doesn't either. And then the third thing here, probably the important thing in terms of communicating the gospel without words. Our lives need to urge our children to live lives worthy of God who calls us. Live a worthy life. The, kind of, the quality of our lives need to be such that it demonstrates a, a life that's worthy of God. Who calls us where? Calls us to what? To his kingdom and glory. Glorifying God in all that we do, in all that we think, in all that we say. So here's couple questions and an illustration. How do you communicate the gospel with your words? How do you communicate the gospel with your words? Do you know the non-essentials of the gospel? Non-essentials of the gospel? What are the non-essentials of the gospel? Well, God's love is non-negotiable. Jesus' death on the cross is non-negotiable. Jesus died on the cross because people sinned. That's non-negotiable. We have to agree with God that we sinned and Jesus paid the price. And it's non-negotiable that Jesus paid the price for our sin and he died, he buried, and he rose again. And it's non-negotiable that he rose from the dead and that we have to place our faith and our trust in a risen Savior. That's non-negotiable. Without any of that, it's not the gospel. How do we communicate the gospel with our words? But then how do you communicate the gospel by your works? Can people know who Jesus is by the way that you act? Even when you don't think you're being watched. Let me flesh this out just a, a little bit as we close. What, what's a healthy Christian anyway? What is a healthy Christian? If you would want to characterize yourself as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ who has a vibrant, healthy relationship with the Lord, how is it? It's a result of their ongoing relationship as a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's the fact. If you have a relationship with God through Jesus, you need to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. What does a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ do? Well, it's someone who is growing in the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. We need to be growing in the fruit of the Spirit. We're growing in the character of Christ and decreasing in the works of the flesh. We know there, there's that battle. Our flesh fights against our spirit, so we need to be growing in the fruit of the Spirit and decreasing in the fruit of the flesh. That's a healthy Christian. That's a healthy Christian. We have to be working on those eight quality characteristics and, and decreasing in the innumerable works of the flesh. Whatever it is that trips us up, we need to be decreasing in that. Secondly, a healthy Christian is sharing the words of Jesus with others. Sharing the words of Jesus with others. We need to know God's word so well. We need to spend time so much in this book that we can share the words of Jesus with others. That's what a healthy Christian does. We share God's word with others. Is doing the works of Jesus. What did Jesus do? He did all kinds of stuff. He spent time with his disciples. He also spent time with the crowds. And in all cases, whatever he did, meeting people at their point of need, 
He reached out and he touched them in all kinds of different ways. We can read the Gospels to find out what Jesus did. And then finally, is able to spiritually grow and multiply disciples by making other disciples. That's a healthy Christian. Look at the words and the works that we use to communicate the gospel. It all boils down to discipleship and healthy Christianity. Oh, if we grasp onto that, if we grab onto that, how much more can we find that uh, we're effective in communicating the gospel? So how do you communicate the gospel with your words? How do you communicate the gospel by your works? Let's think on that and pray on that. We spend a moment with the Lord. Ask him how you can, how you can do that, how you can grow in your health as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. As a mom, as a sibling, as a father, approved by God, and trusted with the gospel. Father, thank you. Thank you for what you're doing in our lives. Thank you, Father, for the opportunities we have. Help us to be more aware, day by day, hour by hour sometimes, of the opportunities we have to share the good news of Jesus Christ with people around us. Lord, help us. Help us to encourage others. Help us, Lord, to be encouraged by your Spirit. Help us, Lord, to be increasing in the fruit of the Spirit and decreasing in the works of the flesh. Lord, we ask your blessing that others might know Jesus and the power of his love. Help us, Lord, to love to tell the story as we seek to communicate the gospel effectively. In Jesus' name. Amen.